Hello and welcome to this course on Introduction to Databases and Querying. My name is Rakesh and in the next few hours or so, we will be going through some basic concepts of getting you started with the concept of databases and storing data and how to query the data that you have stored. All right, so what are the prerequisites of this course? Well, there is no assumption that you have any knowledge about databases. The whole point of this course is to get you started from ground zero and then get you up to speed in order to get to do some basic tasks like how to store some data, how to query the data and so on and so forth. So sit back and relax. This is just, if you're just getting started, this is the course for you. So what to expect from this course? Well we will not be covering any uh, advanced concepts in this course right we will we will just look at some basic stuff like uh, what is data how do we store data how do we join tables you know just so that maybe you're you're looking for um, you know um, an interview where where they ask some basic sql skills and you just want to get started with or get some knowledge about you know how to go about with this SQL thing and how to go about with this database things and so on and so forth. And at the end of this course, you will be comfortable uh, writing some basic queries, writing uh, some aggregations and so on and so forth, which will just cover some basics and not some advanced stuff. So that'll be the overall takeaway from this course. So let's get started. So let's look at the very basic definition of a database. When I pull up Wikipedia, it says that a database is an organized collection of data, right? So data is around us, right? We, we are submerged in data. Anywhere you see, you look like, you look at a airline booking or you look like, um, you know, you look at a, um, maybe amazon.com, you have a lot of products listed and so on and so forth. So all this is just data around us. So it says that a database is an organized collection of data. Now, this is really very tricky because when you say an organized collection, how do you really put this data and in what format? And if you look at the second sentence, it says that it is a collection of tables, queries, reports, views, and other objects. And we will go through this in more details right in, in, in the further slides, but basically you can represent data, you can put it into tables and you can write some queries against these tables in order to retrieve the data that you have just stored. Proceeding, the data is typically organized to model aspects of reality in a way that supports processes requiring information such as modeling the availability of rooms in a hotel in a way that supports finding a hotel with vacancies. Now, let's not get too much into this, but the bottom line is that when you store data, you should have some use to retrieve it, right? I mean, you are storing data so that you can query the data and get some information out of it. Now, the way that you store the data is extremely critical because you don't want to store the data in, in a format that you can't really write an easy query, right? The bottom line is you should be able to retrieve the data. And there are various models to store this data and we won't be going too much in depth. We'll take a very simple concept, let's get started, and then we will slowly start adding more and more information to it. So we, even before we take a deep dive, let's, let's look at some basic airline booking data. So when you go to a website, and book for any flight ticket, you enter in certain information. You enter your first name, last name, age, and stuff, right? And basically it stores an itinerary ID or a booking ID or whatever you call it. Now, where does this store, store it, right? So the company will have a database which will take in all this information and store it in the database. Now, when we talked about retrieval, accessing, and stuff, where does this come into play? Imagine one fine day you call up customer service and say that, oh, I have a problem with my airline booking. Can you help me out with this? So the customer service agent, first of all, asks you for, oh, can you give me a booking ID? And immediately he pulls up your records. Now what he's doing is that he's typing in the booking ID into an application, 
which talks to the database and just pulls up your record which matches the booking ID equal to whatever you gave him. So this is typically how a querying works. So there are syntax, specialized syntax for it, which will help you talk to a database in order to just get the information that you need. And we will be precisely looking at all these different commonly used query and their syntax. Now, when we talk about databases, there are various companies who provide their flavors of databases. You will hear terms like Oracle, SQL Server, and so on and so forth. Now, this course is basically not meant to concentrate more on who is the vendor and stuff. We'll just take, you know, maybe SQL Server, run some basic queries against it. Now, the, the same syntax, most of the time, 99% of the syntax generally applies to all the all the commonly available vendors, right? We, in any case, we aren't going to go too much in advance. So at least the basic querying that you would need would be really covered here, which will help you quickly get started and you can really adapt to whatever vendor um, you know, you're looking forward to work with. All right, let's take one more example, right? You are joining as maybe an analyst and your boss comes to you and asks, okay, pull the total gross booking amount for 2015 right now the way let's assume the weight is stored in the database is something like this so you have a booking number you have a gross amount and you have the date of booking so basically what he's asking you to do is actually give you a total amount total gross bookings for 2015 so there are two parts to it you need data only for 2015 and you need the amounts to be added up meaning you need something like this right so this is where your query comes into play. Your query will be designed in such a way which says that out of this database, just give me entries for 2015 and whatever is returned, just add it up and give the answer to me, right? So this is one, one of the areas where um, effective querying will help you. Now, before we go into too much of, you know, tables, queries and stuff like that, Let's take a step back. Let's see what can we store in a database, right? Database is nothing but a container which will store all your data. And you can arrange those data in tables, views, and stuff like that. And we'll go into it um, in detail. First is text, right? You saw in our um, previous slide that you stored your first name, last name, etc. So basically you can store text. You can store numbers. We, we saw the booking amounts, gross amounts, right? So you can actually store numbers, decimals, and stuff like that. Images, of course, there are various ways to store this in binary format and so on and so forth. There are various querying techniques in order to retrieve the information that you need. Now, again, this is just three examples I have given you, and there are tons of other stuff you can store in a database. You can store XML and stuff like that. And there are various syntax specially designed to retrieve that kind of information. Let's just keep it simple for this course. Okay, how do we store this data? First of all, we need to understand what the data needs to be stored. Right? We need to do a deep analysis of what that data is. Right? Is it something that you're going to be querying? Is it something that you just need to be archived? Is it just something like an ebook, right, where you need to store? Right? So that basically comes up it takes us to a very different world of structured data, unstructured data, and so on and so forth. In this course, we will be just talking about structured data. Structured means nothing but the data that fits into tables. Okay, so accordingly, once we realize what our data is, then we accordingly design some tables because after all, we need some way to query it, right? So we need to have a perfectly designed table so that it's really easy for you to query it. And believe me, this is a very simple task. And then we issue some queries to it in order to retrieve our data. And that's it. So basically, it's a three-step process. Create a database, put some tables in it, store some data in it, and query it. Again, I have really simplified this. There are lots of inbuilt stuff, lots of stuff that you need to do or you can do. And again, those are some things that, that we will not be covering in this course but at least the basic things would definitely be covered in this. All right, so let's put it all together. So let's take the example of an airline database. You create an airline database, 
then you create tables according to your data so let's assume you have you need a table to storing say reservation related data right you create a table with reservation details next you create a detail or detail table for passengers so say you showed their first name last name things like that next say flight information you have your takeoff time your flight numbers and some other data right now a person if he wants some data he would actually query these tables and get the data right he can directly query the reservation table or the passenger table or a combination of both reservation and passenger to see which passengers reserved you know which flights things like that right and that's where the concept of joins and stuff will come into play again it's super simple concepts we'll take it step by step all right so here let's talk a little bit about your environment setup now i want to just let you know that you know when you're just getting started or you know if the expectation from a new job is just to query stuff the environment will already be set up for you generally the environment setup and tuning and all these things are um, you know dbas or database administrators take care of this but the whole point over here is if it is really very simple and if you'd like to follow certain exercises with me let us take some time and set up a very simple environment in order to get started all right so we will be using sql server and again you can really use any flavor 2008 2012 2014 any version uh, the things that we will be using are um, something like just creating databases tables joins and stuff so pretty much whatever you choose it should work um, if 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 you are able to install other um, um, database engines like oracle or mysql and stuff feel free to do that there will be slight syntax changes and stuff so um, we'll be just using sql server here and also we will be using the free editions of sql server so that you don't have to do any investments um, you know when you get started so before we take a deep dive into the installation part let's look at you know at least two two simple differences between database and tools right when you install a database engine which is typically called as a database engine like sql server and stuff you put in data in it and you write queries to retrieve the data from it that that's the basic principle right now how do you pass on the query to the database engine and get the answers back well, there are many ways to do that. You could simply type in your syntax in Notepad or something, and then via command line, just you know, supply that query to the database engine and get it back to us. Now, this is where tools help us. Tools are nothing but just a software which helps you interact with the database. The tools are not the database. All it does is takes your query, passes it on to the database, gets the answers back, and then displays it in a human readable format. So it, it just, it's, it's for convenience sake that we use these tools. So let's, let's look at, um, you know, a few differences. So let's assume you have a database, it's situated in London. Uh, there is another database in USA and another database in Australia. So as I mentioned before, you could very well, you know, connect to these databases and then just pass on your queries via text, via command line and stuff, right? But a simpler way is to use a tool. And Microsoft, when you install um, the database engine, it gives you an option of installing a tool called a SQL Server Management Studio, right? So in Management Studio, you can just provide a connection string, basically, um, you know, the address of the London database or the address of the USA database. We will look at a few examples and just connect to that database and directly interact with the database right from the tool, right? And that's where the, these things become really, really handy. It just it just speeds up your overall, um, you know, um, querying effort. It, it, it provides you a lot of hints. It provides you a lot of syntax checking, right? When you type in a query, uh, even before it sends it to the database, it can tell you whether your query is right or not. Whereas if you use your command prompt and stuff, the typical way of doing it is, you type in a query, it sends to the database and the database executes it and realizes there is an error and sends back an error message. So all those things becomes really very easy when you use a tool 
And in this case, we will be using something called as a SQL Server Management Studio. We'll go through the installation, we'll connect to a few databases, and we will write some simple queries against these databases. Now, these tools are also called as IDEs or Integrated Development Environments. So it, just a technical term, nothing, nothing to worry too much about it. Just thought I'll throw it in there. All right. So we talked about databases and tools. So let me just walk you through how to install your basic tools and databases and you know get your environment set up and running. So let me just Google the express link so that you can follow along with me. And I generally just type in something like this so that you know the, the links always change so I just hate putting it in the descriptions of videos and stuff so you know I, I, I just follow the normal route of searching for it and you know uh, downloading the required tools so if you click on the first link um, it'll show you a download option for downloading the Microsoft SQL Server 2014 Express now Express editions are free editions with very limited features but we'll have everything that we will need for this course. So as soon as you click on download, it's going to give you a bunch of options over here. And what you want to do is actually go ahead and download um, this one, depending upon um, if you have a 32-bit machine or a 64-bit machine, you need to download the Express Advanced Edition. That'll basically have the database engine as well as the management studio, the, the tools that we talked about. So I have just, in, I'm just in the process of downloading this. So you can see, I'm gonna pause this video right now. And after it downloads, I'm going to take you through a step-by-step -step process of installing the database engine and the tools. And then after that, we can get started with our course. Okay, so we have downloaded the <clears throat> software now and you can see that it's about 1.1 GB. So I'm going to go ahead and just run this executable and that'll give you a couple of options to um, install your database as well as install the tools. So let's just wait for a minute. All right. So you get two options here. I'm going to start the standalone installation and okay it looks like there is something running so let me just make sure i have closed everything okay let me retry it okay so <clears throat> this will basically open up a wizard for you and it's it's kind of a step-by-step -step process but it's extremely simple Okay, in the next step, you see that <clears throat> there are a couple of options that you need to choose. And one of them is the management tools. And so your management tools get installed over here. And this is the database engine services. So we don't have to change anything. Just click next. All right. And then I'm going to call this as SQL Express just to keep it very simple. Click next. And then it's going to ask you a couple of questions for server configuration. Again, we can just keep everything as it is. Uh, no need to make any changes as such. Just keep on clicking next. <clears throat> okay, so don't worry about um, mixed mode and Windows authentication. Uh, we'll, we'll cover that later, but mixed mode is basically um, you just just en enter any password that you can remember and this password will be used for logging into your databases. So I generally like mixed mode in my development environments. Um, again, nothing nothing very special about it in this course. Um, just, just type in some password you can remember and click next. And uh, reporting services, again, we're not going to cover reporting services, so it really doesn't matter if you, whatever you choose and then click next. And then this will take about a couple of minutes, maybe 20 minutes or 25 minutes in depending upon what kind of uh, machine you're using. So I'm going to pause this video for some time. And when it completes, we will just uh, review its um, installation. Okay, 
So once when the installation is completed, you will find a success page where it will show you all the components that was installed and you know whether the installation succeeded or not. And let's see what do we have here. So in SQL 2014, you should find management studio. So if you click on that, this was the tool I was talking about. And this is where basically you can connect to your server, right? In this case, it must have installed with a name that is na the same as your machine name, or you could just type localhost or basically just a dot and it'll connect you to the database engine. Now, here, if you remember, we had basically named this instance as SQL Express, right? So we need to, so the way it works is you enter in the name, then a backslash, and then your instance name. So basically you can have multiple instances of, um, you know, um, uh, SQL install on your machine and you can access them using their instance names. The other one where we talked about mixed mode was you remember the password that I asked you to enter that will be easy for you to remember and that's how you log in over here. So you just enter the same password. So I had entered as pass at the rate one, two, three um, and then the login is SA and if you enter in the password you will basically see that um, you know, you're, you are connected to the database. So this tool is the IDE that we talked about and this helps you connect your database. Now in the coming tutorials, we will look at how to create a database, how to put in a few tables, how to put in a couple of data and then how to query it. All right, so in the last few videos, we saw what is a database. It's, it's nothing but a collection of data, a store that that stores your data. How do we organize the data that is in tables, which we call it as structured information. <clears throat> and then but basically we discussed how to get the data out of your database, that is by supplying simple queries. We went through some simple installation, we installed our database engine, and we installed our tool to interact with our database engine, and that's called SQL Server Management Studio. <clears throat> so. In this session, what we're going to do is we're going to run through some very simple syntax, right? We're going to see what are the inbuilt things provided in SQL Server Management Studio and how can we achieve them using queries. So let me give you a walkthrough of this tool. So when you open up this tool, you basically connect to a database. Now, if you remember in a couple of slides before, we, we said that this tool can connect to um, you know, a database in London, a database in USA, a database in Australia, and so on and so forth. And here what we have done is we have connected to a database that's installed on our same machine. So if you want to install, if you want to basically connect to some other database, all you do is connect to database engine and type in that server name, right? And we won't go into too much detail of that, but we're going to just play around with our local database. So once you connect to the database, you get a couple of options here. You can see what all databases are present. Like there are only some system databases that get pre-installed when you install your database engine. You do not have any user created databases here. Uh, we don't have to worry too much about securities and stuff like that, server objects, link servers and stuff. So this is basically how, you know, where we'll get started. So we can interact with this database by supplying some queries. So the way we do it is if you click on new query, it will kind of open up a small window where you can actually type your query and those query will be run against this database engine. And to, to verify that the queries that you run are fired for this database engine only, you can see in the bottom right hand corner it, it lists local slash sql express this is an area which it shows that whatever you type in over here will be issued against this particular server okay now let's do one thing let's go ahead and create a database all right 
So I am going to create a database now. The syntax for creating a database is create followed by the word database and then you give a database name. In this case, I'm calling my test database. Generally, multiple statements when you when you want to just when you have a couple of statements and, and you want certain statements to be committed to the database, you can use the keyword called go. Now don't pay too much attention right now on what is committing a statement, committing data and stuff like that. So this is a general syntax and you see that whatever is the inbuilt keywords is colored in blue. Now these are the advantages when you use an inbuilt tool. So just imagine when you are writing this query via a command line or a notepad and, and issuing these statements to a database, you won't get these kind of support. And this is where uh, a integrated development environment or a tool that can interact with your database can really, really help you. So to execute this statement, I can go to the execute prompt, the execute button, or press F5. So as soon as the command executes, you see that it gives you a result saying command completed successfully. Now, if I refresh my databases, I will see that my test database has been created. Now, if we expand this, you will find that there are folders for tables, views, toad procedures, and stuff like that. Everything will be empty now. You won't find any tables and stuff like that because you haven't created any. Now, you don't really have to enter a query every time. And there are certain things that the tool allows you to do through a wizard. And the way you can create a database is right click and say new database. And then you can just say my test db2. And as soon as you click OK, you'll find the database being created. Now, what it basically did is it gave you a wizard, you typed in your name, and under the hood, it generated a query and issued that query against this database. So it's kind of just a helping layer for you to make things easy. All right, so once this is done, I am going to create a table. The way you create a table is you use the word create, that is a keyword, and instead of database, you say table, and you call, you just give any table name. I'm calling it as my test table. And then you give what columns do you need. So let's say I need a roll number column and the data type should be an integer. A data type is nothing but you say that this column, what value should it have? And we are saying that it should just have integer values. Next, let's say you need a column for storing the first names and you need to store characters. And the max characters, let's say, is 50. So use varchar of 50. Next, let's say you need to store last name, and again, the varchar is 50. So we've just used some simple data types. You remember we talked about in, in the other sli slide where we discussed what all things can a database store? We discussed it can store text, it can store integers, it can store photographs in the form of binary, XML, and so on and so forth. This is an example where you see that we are using integer columns and variable character columns. Now, uh, if I run this query, the way you can run this query is you can basically highlight what you want to run and run this query. If I execute this query, it shows command successfully, completed successfully. However, if you expand my test DB, you will find that it doesn't have that table. The reason being, this command is being executed to the master database, right? So if you go to master, you will find this table being created here. But that's not what we want. So you need to change the overall context of where this query needs to be executed. There are two ways of doing it. One is you go to this drop down and change it to my test DB, or you just use the word use followed by the name of the database where you want this query to be fired against. So my test DB. By the way, did you see that it gives you two options here? So these are the things again that those, you know, the advantages of using tools. So I'm going to highlight this entire thing and I'm going to run it. 
Now there are two things that happen. One, you see this change to my test DV because you're now saying use the context of my test DV. <coughs> now if you expand and refresh the tables, you will find my test table. Okay. All right. So we saw how to create a database. We saw how to create a table inside a database. Let's take one step further and retrieve some data out of the database. The way you do it is select, use the word select, and then you give a list of all columns that you want to retrieve the data from. In this case, it's roll number, first name, and last name. And then you say from which table do you need this? I need it from my test table, right? And again, in this case, I need not use the word use my test DB because my context is already use, using my test DB. But it won't hurt to use that. So let me do that. If I run this, I will get blank results. The reason being, we created a table, we created a database and all those things, but we never inputted any data in the table. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay. The, the general syntax, <clears throat> okay, before I go to inputting data to a table, I wanted to show you some of the inbuilt GUI based stuff that you can play around with. To create a table, again, if you don't want to write a query, you can right click and say table, and it'll kind of give you a wizard. So you can say, this is my column one, the data type should be integers, or you can choose from a list over here. Let's say column two should be something else. And then when you just save this, saving is nothing but just control S, it'll actually save it as a table. Okay, so this is how it's saved. Now to run the query, we use the word select column names and from the table name. If you right click and say select top thousand rows, it basically generates that query for you. So a lot of things you can actually just doing by clicking, but we want to make sure that we're comfortable writing some basic queries because we're going to keep adding more and more information to this and take it to some amount of advanced querying levels. All right, let's go ahead and issue an insert statement. An insert is nothing but a uh, SQL statement that will allow you to put some data into your table. So the way you do it is you use the word insert into and then you say your table name. In this case, it's my test table. You supply the column names, roll number, first name and last name. And then you use the word values. Again, this is a inbuilt keyword values, whatever is in blue is inbuilt keywords. And let's say my roll number is one, my name is Rakesh, and my last name is Gopal, right? Insert into whatever is my table name, then followed by my column names and my values. Now this should match one to one in the sense your roll number should be one, first name should be Rakesh, last name should be Gopal. So the, the placement should exactly match. Now, if we run this particular command, it'll say one row affected, right? Now let's go ahead and see if we can select any rows. Again, I'm highlighting that, pressing F5, and now you see that the database has one row with the data that we just inserted. So this is a good start. Right, you, you created a database, you created a table inside the database, you put some data into the database, into the table, and now we are retrieving it. We'll go into more advanced concepts of how to retrieve data, how to retrieve complex data, how to delete a table, how to delete data, and so on and so forth. All right, so in the last few slides, in the last 20 minutes or so, we looked at how to create a database, we discussed what is a database, you know, what all data can go into a database, how do you organize the data in the form of tables. We also looked at some basic installation about your, you know, for your work environment. And we also looked at some very simple queries, like, you know, how to query the data from a particular table, how to create a table, how to create a database, 
um, you know, how to insert some data and so on and so forth. Going forward, what we'll do is we will actually take a deep dive into querying. We'll look at various syntax, right? We'll look at aggregation, how to query a single table, how to conditionally query a single table, how to join multiple tables and so on and so forth. We'll start with again, very simple stuff. We'll keep on adding information and I will be taking a little bit different approach from here onwards. What we'll do is instead of me going through a syntax and then showing you, let's let's take a good database like a, you know, which, which has certain number of tables and data and let's just discuss some problem statements, something like, give me all the employees who were hired after so and so date and let's see how can we create a query for them so it will kind of give you a real world aspect of when questions are asked how do you go about approaching those kind of problems so what we'll do is microsoft provides some sample databases we're going to go ahead and install that the reason being we don't have to create data that that's pretty much you know, a good list of tables, good list of data. It's something, you know, something like a real world data. Uh, they call it the Adventure Works database. It's it's actually a very simple installation. Um, you know, we just download it and then just uh, attach the databases into our database engine, and then we can start querying it. I'll, I'll precisely show you how to do that. It's a very simple procedure. And then we'll look at certain things like querying a single table, then we'll look at some conditional querying, and then we'll look at some where clauses and so on and so forth. So let's go ahead. All right, so what I'm going to do is, again, I'm going to just um, Google AdventureWorks, and let's see. Okay. So here are some product samples. It is provided by msftdbprodsamples.coteplex.com. Let's go ahead and see what all it provides. Okay, let's go ahead and download this. And let's see. So we are using a 2014 version, so 2012 should be compatible. Let's go ahead and save this. And I already have this saved, um, but let's see. Let's just call this as underscore one and then let's save this. It's, it's a small file, it's about 36 MB, I believe. Uh, let's see, yeah, around 36 MB. And um, it all, so let's, let's download that. And in parallel, I'll also open my management studio. Okay. And let me connect to my database. And again, you'll find the two databases that we created in our previous session. Now this has downloaded, so I'm going to go ahead and just unzip this here. And once I unzip this, you should find two tables. The MDF file is your actual database file. LDF file is where it stores logs. So don't worry too much about it right now. And we will just go ahead and use this let me just go ahead and put this into a different folder and all right so i am going to use this path and let me go ahead and right click on databases and say attach once i click on attach it's going to ask me my mdf file location and I'm going to just input my MDF file location. Okay, so let's say okay, and it'll also pick up the LDF file, and let's click okay, and then you should see your database restored here. If you open up the tables, you will find a lot of data that they provide you. So let's select the top 1000 rows, and you see that there is some inbuilt data to play with. Now. This actually gives us some base work to play with data, and we'll precisely use the same database. And if you want to follow along with me, go ahead and download this database and attach it to your local environment, and then you can follow um, the queries along with me. Welcome back. So in this session, what we'll be doing is, we will be taking a different approach. We will be discussing some problem statements and we'll try to write some query against it. So what we'll do is, 
we will cover some concepts by directly writing queries against our AdventureWorks database. So let's get started. I'm going to click on new query and let's just make sure we are using the right database. All right. Okay, let's get started. Now, let's let's look at some tables first, right? Let's look at the department table and write a select query. So select um, name or let's say select star from human resources dot department. So star generally means that give me everything, all the columns. So if you say, if you look at our columns, we have four columns, star will just give you everything. Just, just highlight that, press F5, and you can look at some sample data over here. So it has about 16 rows, and let's write some queries against them. So let's start with something simple. Let's say, show me all the department names. By the way, you see the two dash I have put over here? That basically says that this is a comment, right? I mean, these statements will not be executed. And these are just plain comments where, you know, you put it in front of your code so that you can understand your code a little bit more better. And this can be any text. So let's proceed. Select name from human resources dot department. And let's see what it gives us. So it should give us only the names. All right, let's proceed. How about we get all the groups? Show me all the groups. So groups is basically stored in this group name. So basically what we're going to do is select group name from human resources dot department. So you get the idea by now. Right, you select, you use the word select followed by the column names and then you specify the table name in order to get the results. And again, just to reiterate, the ones you see in blue are the inbuilt keywords. All right, now I wanted to introduce you to a keyword called distinct. Now, if you look at the group names, you see a lot of repetitions, right? It just gives you all the rows. But what if I asked you, just give me the distinct values from here. Don't repeat it, right? So something like this, show me all the distinct group names. And this is where the keyword distinct comes handy. So you say select distinct group name from human resources department. You see that it gives you just a unique set of values. Cool. Now, I want to introduce you to filtering. And this is where we use the where clause. So let's, let's say, let's actually look at all the data once more. And, it, and by the way, you can selectively just highlight what you want in the, in the query and then click or press F5 to execute that part of the query. So this is our overall data. And let's say if we just want to look at any record that has the word manufacturing in it. So you see we have record number seven, eight, and probably that's it. So this is where you know our where clause comes handy. So show me all the department department names who are a part of manufacturing, right? So the way you do it is select, uh, let's choose name and group name, right? From our adventure works or human resources or department. And where we say that where group name, we introduce a keyword called like. Like is basically you say that the group name should match the word manufacturing. Now, this is more likely we, we call it as an exact match. So it's going to look at the 
column group name and it's going to see if it has a value called manufacturing let's see what it gives us so it gives us two rows right now okay now let's um, since we have introduced where clauses let's basically um, you know play around a little bit with where clauses right you see that we filtered by using a text let's filter by using some integers as well so let's just just so that it doesn't get too boring let's choose some other table so let's say give me all the employees um, from the employee table you know we have an employee table here so I'm going to just write a query called select star from human resources dot employee I'm going to press F5 and this gives us about 290 rows so you see here it's it's about 290 rows and it has a bunch of information okay now let's 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 play around with a where clause okay let's say give me a list of um, say all employees who have a org level you see the organization level equal to two right so here we are filtering based on an integer let's see how to write that select star from human resources dot employee where organization level equal to two so you see for an integer we use the sign equal to and for text we use the keyword like okay let's see what this gives us so you see that it gives us only the rows that have an organizational level equal to two perfect now let me slightly modify this let me say give me a list of all employees who have org level equal to two or three you see there are two two um, conditions I have put here right okay let's see how about how we go about writing this we say select star from human resources dot employee these things remain the same where organization level in two comma three so we introduce the keyword in here basically it says that you have a list and give me all the rows which match this criteria let's see what it gives us so sure enough it gives us all records which have an organization level as two or three right perfect okay now let's take one more example of of a text value just so that we get some practice let's say we need um, okay let me just look at the data once more okay okay let's choose this row facilities manager so let's say give me a list of employees who have a title as facilities manager so by now you must have figured out we write select star from human resources dot employee where job title so should it be equal or should it be like now we are going to use a text match here so we'll use the keyword like facilities manager so sure enough it just gives us one row now what happens if I don't match the casing if I write something like this facilities manager all uppercase what do you think will happen here let's find out you see that still it gave you that one row back this means that this is not case sensitive you can pretty much you know use any casing 
and basically if the text matches it's going to give you that record back okay now one thing you find over here is you're doing something called as an exact match meaning whatever you have given here should exactly match with the job title let's try something else you see i put two spaces in the end so what it is doing is it is trying to match from the set of records the keyword facilities manager space space and there is no record like that because it's doing an exact match what if i told you there is a wild card where you say that okay give me all the records that at least have the word manager in it i don't really care whether it's facilities manager or any other manager so the way you do that is using a wild card so let's 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 say something like this give me all the employees who have a title or let's say who have the word manager in their title right how about that so we say select star from human resources but job title like manager now would this give us any result at all no let's see it won't because it's basically checking for an exact match right but what we need is we need to get all the records that basically have that keyword wherever it is but we basically it should have the word manager in its job title so we introduce something called as a wild card it's a person sign this basically says that anything can be before the word manager but nothing should be after the word manager right so if we execute this you see that the percent is anything that is before the word manager and there's nothing after the word manager right so this is how you um, look at this is how you do pattern matching now let's look at one more example you see the job title production control manager document control manager let's say we want to basically return all the records that have the word control right and anything can be before and after the word control the way you do this is control and after control you put a person sign which means that anything can be before the word control and anything can be after the word control but you need to have the word control in your um, job title let's look at this see this is how you so in this case there is nothing and that's also a perfectly valid scenario right and you see this is how the pattern matching happens so this is kind of playing around with you know how to filter your data using text and using integers all right so let's let's go further now i want to introduce you to a little bit more where clauses but we'll be we'll be trying to filter out some dates right we we have your birth date higher date let's try to play around with them we'll have a separate session on how to manipulate dates but here the point of the the, the next few queries is just to see what are the possibilities to filter out dates okay now let's say let's just look at the entire data set okay now let's say we want to get all employees who are born after say 1st of january 1980 so how do we do that so give me all employees who are born after jan 1 1980 how do we do that again this will give us all the employees but we need to add a filter so we say where birth date and this is where we introduce the greater than sign greater than month date 1980 let's see what this does so sure enough you see that it's it's kind of filtered all the data 
and given you all the records which match this criteria where the birth date is greater than 1st of January 1980. Perfect. All right. How about now we play around with some range, date ranges, right? We say that give me all the employees who are born between 1970 and 1980. Let's see how that looks like. So give me all employees who are born between Jan 1, 1970 and Jan 1, 1980. So how do we go about doing that? So one of the ways is using, of course, you can, you can say that where birth date is greater than 1st January 1970 and birth date it's birth date I think I should just make this correction quickly here is less than 1st of January 1980 right so this will give you that range SQL server also provides you another inbuilt keyword to do this so you say that select let me just copy paste this part and that's called as the between clause so you say birth date between 1 1 1970 and 1 1 1980 so it's going to look between these dates and return the results to you so you see that all are between 1970 and 1980 okay so I think um, you must have got a good understanding of some of the key concepts here. Um, what we will do is we will look at some advanced concepts now. We'll look at some ordering clauses, how to order your data in ascending order, how to order your data in descending order, how to join tables, how to run some aggregations and so on and so forth. Okay, so in the last few minutes we, we saw a couple of queries and let's just continue and add more and more concepts <clears throat> so let's take a quick revision of what we discussed so far we looked at the select everything so we, where we use a select star it'll just give you everything from the table then we looked at some filtering aspects where we said that for text use the like operator we also looked at some filtering where your filter criteria is an integer where we use the equal to we also tried filtering based on a, a list of values so where we use the in clause then we looked at how to um, filter based on certain text right um, full match criteria kind of a thing then when we also looked at how to filter based on partial criteria we we used the percentage sign uh, an exact match versus a non-exact match then we played around with dates a little bit we used a greater than where we filtered our data based on birth date greater than 1980 we also looked at how to use ranges and we also looked at an example where we use the between clause to specify uh, two dates um, between which you want to filter okay so let's proceed here I wanted to throw in a new concept called as calculated columns and as the name suggests it's nothing but you introduce a third column which is not a part of the table based on certain columns that the table already has right so for example if a table has the quantity and the prices for each quantity you could perhaps introduce a third column and call it as whatever quantity multiplied by uh, the price something like that so let's let's have a look at um, some examples so let's let's select some of the tables so that again it doesn't get too boring so let's see if we can use the product table let's see what it has so select star from production dot product let's see what it has again let me just quickly enter my password 
oops need to remember this okay so here we have some some good data and we have list price okay so let's let's look at some narrow range let's look at the name and the list price you know so that we don't look at all the infinite number of columns that this table has okay so a calculated column is nothing but something that you introduce so you say select name list price and let's say you want to introduce a third column and you want to just give a ten dollar increase to the list price so you say list price plus ten and this is where our concept of alias comes into place alias is nothing but any name that you can give to a column and i'll call this as say adjusted list price you can call it anything i'm just calling it adjusted list price and from production dot product okay let's see how this looks like okay so so if you see that these two are the columns that the table provides this is basically a column that you introduced and what you basically did was that whatever was in list price you just added ten dollars to it okay so sometimes these things can be really very handy and you know as and when you start writing more complex queries you feel that you know these things can can really help you a lot to put put your logic in certain columns your inbuilt logic or the logic that you have derived into certain columns for easier querying okay now since we have started to manipulate and introduce stuff um, I will introduce you to a few statements that can help you create tables delete tables and update tables we looked at something very simple in our previous lesson um, where we just wrote insert into something values blah 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 and it created a table here we are going to take a slightly different approach okay what I want is so this statement which I have highlighted just displays the result right it's not stored anywhere what I want is actually to store this in a separate table so how do I do that we introduce something called as an into clause so the way it works is you write your logic right and then you say whatever is the value you insert into a table right you can give some table name let's call this as production dot product underscore two now please note that this table doesn't exist right now so what it is going to do is it's going to execute this query and whatever are the values that are returned it's going to put it into this table okay so let's complete this now first question is when this table is created where will it be placed in which database well it depends on what context you are running right now you are running under adventure works 2012 so it will actually create a table under adventure works 2012 so let me try executing this query okay so 504 rows affected now if we refresh our tables we should find a new table called product 2 that has been newly created now let's run a select star from production dot product 2 now if you see there's a third column introduced here this was not a part of the product table but you wrote your query in such a way that you introduced the third column and the total results of this table is actually pushed into this table called product underscore two and this is where certain introducing such tables and calculations might become very handy so imagine that you have a lot of complex logic right and you want to break it down into steps you can keep putting this into separate tables and you know perform calculations now i can i can perform some calculations on this table product 2 and i can put that results into another table right and in 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 this 
course, we might not go in too much depth about temporary tables and permanent tables, but let me just give you a very high level overview of that. What we just created is a permanent table, meaning this table is actually stored in the database. Whoever connects this database can actually view this table, right? There is, second, there is a second form of table that you can create called as temporary table. Temporary table, let me show you. Let me create, let me push this result into another table. Here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write hash followed by a table name. And I'll call this as, say, temp table, temp name, something like this. This hash actually tells SQL Server that whatever table it's going to create should be a temporary table. Temporary table meaning this table is visible only for you. It's just a very um, rough table for you. Uh, as soon as you end this session, meaning if you just close this window or open a new connection, this table will just vanish, right? You'll not have access to this table. So it's kind of, if you have, again, some complex logic where you just want to push some results to a temporary table, work with the temporary table, and then finally dispose of the table, that's where, you know, that's one of the places where temp tables can really be useful. Let's, let's try to run this query. So 504 rows affected. Now, if I write select star from hash temp name, you will find those values, right? Now, as I said, this is a temporary table. If I open a new session, right, and run this query in this new session, it will actually say invalid object name because in this session, it, it cannot see your temporary variable, it, sorry, your temporary table that you created, right? So just you need to be a little careful when you're using these things. Okay, we looked at how to push data into a table. Let's look at how to delete data from a table. Now, this is actually super simple. Let's, let's play around with our new table that we introduced the product underscore two. Let's say you want to delete the row that has a name called bearing ball, right? So the way you do it is delete, delete is an inbuilt keyword. You say delete from my table, you give the table name, and then you just filter on the rows where you want you know, the deletion to occur. So delete from product two where name like we use the like operator right before when we were working with text bearing ball now one thing to note here is it's going to do an exact match here right we don't have the person sign or something so it's going to actually look for the word called bearing ball and going to delete that row completely let's give it a try it says one row affected which means there was at least one row which matched this criteria now, if I run a select star from this table, you will not find that bearing ball row. See? Now, since we didn't use a partial match, there, there are some rows which have at least that word called ball bearings, but it will not get deleted. But you get the idea. Okay. And finally, I also wanted to tell you something about an update statement. An update statement is nothing but something that updates a given table, a given row, right? So <clears throat> let's run through an example. The way you write it is using the keyword update followed by your table name. So it basically says that update this table. And then you give a condition as to what should be the update and which row should it affect. So you say set name equal to Let's say, let's say update this one, blade, right? Set name equal to blade underscore new. I'll just call it new. The updated value should be new, where name like blade, <coughs> sorry, blade. Okay. Now, please note, you are assigning this new value to this column. So that's why we don't use the like operator here. What we are saying is update this table where name is blade and whatever rows qualify that criteria just update the name to blade underscore new let's see 
what happens now says one criteria match what you one of the rows matched your criteria and then we say select star from production dot product two and we should find our updated value here <clears throat> see there you go so this is like a high level overview of how you would insert some data delete some data <clears throat> and update some data and again these kind of temp tables and permanent tables really really help you when you have super complex logic and you just want to you know um, um, cut them into smaller pieces and then work with smaller tables kind of a thing the uh, other criteria where i could think of is um, I was working with a table recently which had like millions and millions and millions of row and I just wanted to you know do some analysis on on a portion of the data right one way is of course to use square clauses and stuff like that but what I did was that I just pushed a thousand rows from there into a temp tables and I worked with it it's just more faster so depending upon what things you use uh, you might want to use a temp table or a permanent table um, and so on and so forth so in the last few sessions, we have been seeing how to query some tables. But if you observe, we have always queried via a single table, right? We have not referenced two or three tables. We always, we just fire our queries against a single table. Now, in real world, most likely, you will have to query multiple tables together, right? Data is actually shared across multiple tables. And that's where we use the concept of joins. So joins is nothing but, you know, it's, it's, it's a syntax, it's a query which helps you join two or more tables based on certain criteria, right? When two or more tables are to be joined, there will be at least one column which is common across both the tables. And we'll look at a few examples. And this is one of the most commonly um, occurring um, scenarios where we have to join two or more tables. So depending upon what kind of data you want to retrieve in the sense if you're joining table one and table two um, do you need just the common rows or you know just the rows which are from table one and which is matching from table two and various scenarios there are there are uh, certain types of joins that are introduced so we'll go through them one by one we'll look at some visual examples and then what we'll do is we will take our adventure works database and actually write some queries so you can get to see in real world how does this happen all right so there are three types mainly there are three types of joins one is an inner join next is an outer join and third is a cross join let's look at them one by one okay inner join let's assume you have a table which which is pretty simple okay you have an employee id column the first name and the last name pretty simple table but you have a second table called as say which just stores the salary of employees right so it has an employee id and a salary now what if i asked you give me all the employees their first name last name and the salary in in the previous sessions when we had to do something like this we would have expected that the salary column is in the same table but here we are seeing it's in two different tables right so that means there should be some way in which we could join these two tables and get our results. Now, if you observe closely, you see that employee ID is common across both the tables. So I can say that employee one, whose first name is Michael, would have a salary as 10,000 because the same employee ID is referenced in the second table. And that's where the concept of joins really, really becomes very interesting. Now, the speciality of this inner join, this type of join, is that you will only get the rows which are common across both the tables, right? In this case, there are three rows that are common across both the tables, and that's what will be returned. The thing is that there should be at least one match between both the tables, right? In this case, employee ID 1, 2, and 3 are perfect matches between both the tables, and you will get three rows when you inner join these two tables don't worry we will look at an example where this will be more and more clear to you okay let's look at outer joins okay 
let's consider a table right which has employee id first name and last name let's look at another table which again has an employee id and the salary this is pretty much the same scenario that we discussed in the previous slide but here we are just taking a very slightly different approach we are going to introduce a new concept called as outer joints we introduce a third table which stores employee id and phone number now what is interesting in these three tables in a previous slide we saw that table one and two had the exact number of rows right you had employee id one two three employee id one two three in both the tables here we are introducing a third table called as whatever phone number right but you see that employee id three is missing here right employee id 3 doesn't have a phone number and hence they haven't even entered in the table now what if i told you give me all the employees and their phone number if they have them right so one of your answers would be okay let's join table number one and table number three but in inner join as i mentioned before only the common rows will be accounted for meaning if you inner join table one and table three you will get employee id one and two but not three because there is no entry for employee id three in table three i hope you're getting the difference here we are not talking about common rows right and that's where the concept of outer join comes into play so let's introduce the concept of left outer joints right okay let's let's take a table which it's very simple employee id first name and last name let's take another table employee id and phone number pretty much the same thing that we just discussed in our previous slide now what happens when i left join table one with table two left join basically says that give me all the rows of table one okay give me all the rows of table one and also give me all the common rows of table two right but if you don't find a common row if you don't find a join just replace by null might be confusing let's look at the results so you see employee id one and two are common across both the tables so it perfectly joined this is you would have got two rows if you had just inner joined both these tables but a left outer join basically says take everything from the left side table whatever is your left side table in this case it is table one take everything right take whatever you can join from table two that is the right side table and whatever you cannot join put a null over there so in this case if you see employee id three is not present in table two so it cannot join so it simply put a null in the phone number column if we have to imagine this a little bit visually you say take everything from table one and all things that are common right and then whatever didn't match replace it with a null all rows from left table included non-matched entries from right table will have null okay so this is the main difference let's just take a step back what is inner join inner join just look for common rows what is an outer join especially a left outer join take everything from the left hand side table take everything which matches with the right hand right hand side table and the ones that does not match just replace it with a null okay let's look at something different right outer join it's exactly the opposite so let's take another example table one two rows two columns employee id and parking spots right then you have table two which stores employee id and employee names now how would you join these two tables employee id is the common column which will help us join these two tables but if you look at the right hand side table it has two extra rows for employee id three and employee id four right now if i write outer join what will happen table one right join table two meaning take everything from table two and whatever matches with table one substitute the values whatever does not match put a null right so that's the basic difference when you have a left outer join that means take everything from the left table when you have a right outer join take everything from the right right table 
So that's the major difference. So all rows from right table included, non match entries from left table will have null. Now, if we look at this visually, you see that everything from table two is included plus the common rows and whatever is left out is substituted as null. So three concepts, inner join, inner join is nothing but just look at the common rows. Left outer join, nothing but take everything from the left hand table, whatever matches, get the values, whatever does not match with the right table, substitute a null. Exactly opposite is the right outer join. Take everything from the right hand side table, whatever matches, join it. Whatever does not match with, left with the left table, just substitute a null. Again, we will look at more and more examples, so don't worry. Okay, we looked at left outer join, we looked at right outer join. Now let's introduce another concept called as a full outer join. Now full outer join is actually pretty simple. It's basically a combination of what we studied before for left outer join and right outer join, right? So we take everything from left hand side table, whatever matches, take it from right hand side, substitute by null and do the same thing for the right hand side table. Let us look at an example. So table one, just two columns, column one, customer ID and customer name. Table two, four columns over here. I'm sorry, three columns, but four rows over here. You have an order number, order name and customer ID. So which is the common column across both the tables? It is customer ID, right? So now just imagine what will you do if table one left joined with table two, meaning you'll have everything from here, one and three, so, and whatever does not match, it will be substituted as null, right? Now, let's look at how things change when we do a full outer join. We take, first of all, we take all common rows, right? So, when table one is full outer join with table two, the customer ID one is common. So, you take the common set of information, okay? Now, Customer ID three is not there in table two, so you substitute by null, okay? Now do the same thing from table two. Let's look at customer ID two. The information is not present in table one, so we substitute a null. Similarly, we follow for all the rows. So basically, it's a combination of your left outer join and right outer join. So you will have all rows from your left-hand side table and all rows from your right-hand right -hand side table Whatever matches, you will find a complete row set. Whatever does not match will simply have nulls. Okay, so all rows from your left and right table are included. Non-matched entries from left and right table will have null. So if we were to look at this a little bit visually, this is how it will look like. You'll have everything from table one plus common rows plus everything from table two again we will look at some examples which will make it more and more clear. But the bottom line is, it's just a combination of left outer join and right outer join. And in the end, let us introduce one more called as a cross join. Take an example, table one, two columns, table two, two columns, right? Department ID is basically the common column here. So cross join is nothing but this row, the first row, will be joined with row one and two with the second table. Similarly, second row would be joined with one and two. So each row from table one will be joined with every row from table two. So your end result will look something like this. So you have one, one A joined with sales and marketing, right? And then two, A2 joined with sales and marketing. So every row, if you see every row from table one is joined with every row with table two includes rows from both the tables. So this is a very high level overview of inner joints where we just take common rows, outer joints, which basically has multiple things. One is left outer join where we say take everything from left hand side table um, and whatever does not match with the right hand side, put nulls. Similarly, right hand side, right outer join is, is the exact opposite. Then we looked at full outer joins and then we looked at cross joins. So don't worry, let's look at a few examples now. So in the last few sessions, we, we looked at joins 
right? And we, we look at what is an inner join, what are outer joins, what are the types of outer joins, and we looked at a few examples. <clears throat> so we covered these concepts more conceptually, right? We, we looked at a couple of tables and then, you know, we looked at how the results would look like. What we're going to do now is actually write some queries. We're going to look like, we're going to look at how inner joins work, how to join two tables and, and stuff like that. So let's actually take the same examples that we covered in our slides. And what I'll do is I'll actually create those tables, insert some values, join those tables and so on and so forth. So some of the queries that we look at here, like something like creating a table, inserting values and stuff like that might be more repetitive for you. So if you feel it's too boring, feel free to forward it until the point where you actually uh, reach the jo joins part or the outer joins part and so on and so forth. So <clears throat> let's get started. So when we looked at joins, we looked at something like this, right? We looked at two tables and we said that when we join these two tables using a common column, what we get is the common rows between those two tables. So precisely let's do that. Let's create two tables. One it's called, let's call it like my employee or something, another my salary. And let's just insert three rows in it. And once we insert them, let's look at how an inner join output uh, will look like. All right. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and create a table. And I'm going to call this table as say my employee. So let's say create table my employee. And let's say it just has three columns in it. And I'm going to call these columns as employee ID and that can be an integer. <clears throat> then you can have a first name that can be a variable character 20 and then a last name. Simple stuff. So just three columns. And just want to make sure that I spell things correctly here. Okay. Now let's just put all these in our adventure works database and later on, you know, we can um, remove them. So I'm going to create this table. Oops, and let me make sure. So these are two options in SSMS wherein you can export the results to a file or a grid. We'll just export it to a grid. All right, so we have a table. Now let's go ahead and insert some rows into it. So insert into my employees. Um, values and then what do we want to insert say one Michael Scott all right and I'm going to copy it three times now just to make sure we insert three rows and then you know I'll have to make sure that I change these values so let me do that real real quickly and all right, so we have a table and we have about three rows in it. Let's let's just have a look at that table. Oh, there's an object and let's go ahead and insert three rows and say select star from my uh, employee. All right, we have three tables, uh, sorry, three rows and a single table. All right, so now next what we're going to do is we're going to do the same thing for my salary. And again, if you feel that, you know, <clears throat> these are too repetitive, go ahead and, you know, feel free to skip this part. Um, I'm creating a, a, a table called my salary. I'm just making consistent. Um, and then again, it's, it's going to have an employee ID and that can be an integer. And then it's going to have say salary, right? And <clears throat> I'm just giving it a float. So, you know, you can include decimals if you want, but that's not a point here. And again, the same thing, insert into my salary, and then the value should be uh, for employee ID one, I'm giving him $10,000. <clears> and then for two and three, I'll give them like 8,000 and 6,000, something like that. All right, so we have a table and we have inserted three rows and then let's do select star from my 
salary. So these are the three rows. All right, so pretty much we have the same table that we looked at in our example, right? And what I'm going to do is so that just so that you can look at both the tables together, <clears throat> I'm going to paste them one below the other. So these are the two tables. Now, what will happen when we join both these tables via the employee ID? <clears throat> so it's going to give you all the common rows that both these tables have. So let's look at that. So I'll start off with select star. And again, I'm just saying we're choosing everything, but we'll go ahead and change this later. And I'm going to say from my employee. And generally we have to give an alias here. So the alias name can be anything, A, A, B, C, anything, anything that you like. And now I'm going to say inner join, employee inner join with my second table. That's my salary. And again, I'm going to give um, alias over here. Once I inner join both these tables, I need to also tell them what is the common column between these tables. <clears throat> so it can be a dot employee ID equal to b dot employee ID. Simple stuff. I forgot something. It's on a dot employee ID equal to b dot employee ID. Perfect. Now I'm going to remove this chart and I'm going to say that I need the f uh, first name and the last name from my first table and the salary from my second table. And incidentally, my first table is referred by the alias A. So if I do A dot first name, A dot last name, and my salary is in my second table, which has an alias as B. So I can say B dot salary. So imagine that you are joining two or more tables. You can easily refer to the various columns between these tables via this particular alias dot column name. <clears throat> okay, let's execute this entire thing. You see that this is select star from my employee, this is select star from my salary, and this is how it joined. So three, three, three rows in both the tables, and the resultant is three rows in the last table because there were three common rows. So one thing to note again here is inner joins means it'll only give you, give you the rows which are common between these two tables. All right, great. So we have some amount of knowledge in inner joins. Let's proceed and look at some outer joins. So I'm going to start with left outer join. And we're going to look at what we discussed when we mentioned about outer joins and left outer joins. When we discussed our left outer joins, we said that we have two tables, right? Um, the first table is what we just created as my employee. And the second table is something that we'll create. But if you see that the first table has three rows and the second table has only two rows, what left outer join does is it takes every row from your left table and it takes all the rows from your right table that is common with your left table and whatever is not common, it just marks as at null. So this will be the result. You see that the row number one, two are common. So you find data from both the tables Whereas three, the third row is only available in your left table. So the there is, it could not find a corresponding match in the right table, hence it replaced by null. Let's see how it looks like when we write a query. All right, so we have our employee table. We just need to create our phone table. So I'm gonna say create table my phone. And again, let's just keep it simple. Let's say employee ID as in teacher and phone number, um, as integer okay and then let's go ahead and insert two rows insert into my phone values can be one one two one 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 two three three four two something like that right and then we say insert into my phone values for my second employee all right so we have a phone table we have inserted two rows into it, and let's look at the employee and phone table, one below the other, and see how it looks like. All right, so we have the phone table, we have the employee table, and let's see how the syntax looks like and how the results look like when we do employee left join with phone. So the syntax is pretty much the same, select star from my employee, and again, you need to give an alias, so I'm giving it as A. 
and this time instead of an inner join i'm going to write left join with my phone and i'm going to give it an alias on a dot employee id because that's the common row equal to b dot employee id and instead of star i need first name then a dot last name and i need a dot oops b dot salary or phone number okay so you see that we're joining the first table with the last with the second table using a left join and let's see what it gives us this is your first table this is your second table it could match the first two rows employee id one and two employee id one and two but it didn't find an entry in the third row for the third row employee id three so it replaced it by null so basically what you're saying is whatever is in the left part of this clause take every row and if you find a match well and good if you don't find a match put a null that's the whole concept of this so the same thing also applies for right joins so let's just extend that same concept in right joins so when we discuss right joins what did we say we said that we have two tables and it's kind of the opposite of a left join you see that in your table two you have four rows in your table one you have two rows and out of those two rows all two the, the, both the rows are present in both tables that is those are the common rows right so <clears throat> when you do table one right join with table two it basically says take everything from table two and if you find a match with table one well and good if not put a null in the in the um in the corresponding um cells so employee id one and two common yes you got data from both we're good employee id three and four there is data only in the table two in the right table so take that and put nulls for your left tables so let's look at this so we have the employee table right now and we just need to create one more table called say parking and then we can test this out perfect so let's go ahead and create a parking table so create table my parking and then again i'm just going to create some columns here employee id in teacher and then let's say parking spot can be var care of 20. <clears throat> all right and then what we're going to do is we're going to again insert some values <clears throat> insert into my parking uh, values can be for employee id one the parking spot can be a1 and for employee id two the parking can be a2 right so let's look at the employee and the phone and the parking tables side by side execute this insert two rows and then select star from my parking all right so table one employee table two parking what we are going to do just for clarity let me do it this way actually so that you can look in the same order okay so what we're going to do is select star from parking or my parking and give it an alias a but this time we're going to say right join with my employee <coughs> b on what is a column column common column is a dot employee id equal to b dot employee id and then i'll go ahead and say um from my first table i need the parking spots from my second table i need um, the first name and the last name let's look at how this looks like all right the first table second table we saw that the two when you say right join everything from your right table is accounted for whatever it found a match a1 a2 it filled in those and whatever it did not it basically put a null over there so it's it's kind of you know if, if you understand left join it's it's opposite and so on and so forth now let's proceed let's look at how a full outer join looks like so kind of when we discussed full outer join what did we look at we looked at a table we looked at a customer table and the order table and we basically said that it's actually a combination of your left join and right join that is whatever is common gets filled up on both tables 
um, then kind of you look at from a left joint perspective where you see that you know um, you, you account for all the rows and then whatever matches you fill in whatever does not match you put nulls and do the same thing for the right table as well so um, let's let's create these two tables so that you can have a look right and this is how visually it looks like all right so I am going to go ahead and create a customer table so I'm going to say create table my customer and then I'm going to say customer ID and then what what did we have customer name yeah customer name and then I'm going to just insert two sample values All right, and I'm going to copy this and insert another row. Perfect, so we have a customer table and we have two rows in it. Insert into each, oh, okay. I forgot a parenthesis, okay. All right, and then we had a order table as well. So let me just quickly go ahead and create the order table. We had the order number and we, I think we had the order name and then just the customer ID, which is basically your column where you can use to join your two tables. All right, so we have an order table and then what we're going to do is insert into my order values can be one, call it some order one. And one okay just four values one two three four okay so we have four values now and then what we're going to do is we're going to look at both these tables together Oops. Okay. Two rows in the first table, two, four rows in the next table. Okay. So how should the output look like? Let's look at it. Select star from your first table. In this case, um, it's a customer table. Give it an alias. And now you use the word full outer join, and then you use my order as the second table and join via um, a dot customer ID equal to b dot customer ID. And then I would like to look at basically everything, but you know, let's just use your column names. I need the customer ID and the customer name from my first table. Oops and I need a couple of um, columns from my second. Let's take the order number um, and the order name. Okay, that should be it. And let's just format this a little bit so that you can see things more clearly. Okay. So the first two rows were common between both the tables. So that's why you find table from both the tables um, but you don't find so actually let me do one thing let me just make it a little more interesting I'll say truncate table my customer and I will actually use a slightly different data okay now let's see how things look like okay now you see there's just one row that is common across both customer ID one and customer ID one. So that's why you find the entire data from both the tables. Next it goes to the second row. Three, John, it puts in here, it didn't find anything in the right side table, it put nulls. Now, it does the same thing for your right side table. 
the first row it finds common so naturally it, it actually matched the columns um, with the bo bo both the tables and then for order number two seven and eight there are no corresponding entries in your customer table so it put nulls so it's kind of a combination of your left join and your right join okay now before we conclude let's look at our last concept that is cross join cross join what we said is if you have two rows from table one two rows from table two cross join will actually join with every single row right table one will join with two rows table uh, the two rows for each row of table one so that's why you see that the rows start repeating again we'll just best way is to look at an example so let's actually look at these two itself right so we don't waste time creating another table so we say that select star from my customer um, the syntax is cross join with my salary and let's see how this looks okay so my customer you cross join with my salary so that's why you're seeing every entry has three rows right so two rows from the first table three rows from the second table so the first row that is customer name Rakesh customer ID one joined with every single row from your second table similarly it took the second row joined with every single row in the second table so that's basically what is a cross join and another interesting way to write this is something like this my customer comma my salary and it it will pretty much give you the same result it's just an alternate way of representing it so we looked at some few examples of how to join stuff and again sometimes it can be a little confusing and it's it's just writing more queries and getting more used to it basic rule of thumb is um, you know look at two tables look at what is the common column and basically analyze what kind of data you need do you need just the common rows or just the rows from all the rows from left table all the rows from right table and accordingly just apply our joints and you can extend the same same concept to multiple tables as well you can write table a inner join table b on some common column and again you can write inner join table c with again a, a joining column so once you master this concept it's actually becomes really really very really interesting and you know for data analysis because you'll have lots of tables and this will allow you to easily join each table run aggregations run summations and so on and so forth so i hope you enjoyed the concept of joins see you later in this session we are going to take a deep dive on date functions so most of your data will contain some dates right you can have a, you know, if you're dealing with say products you can have order dates shipping dates stuff like that and it kind of becomes very critical when you start querying these and start applying some calculations for example if you want to know what is the difference of days between whatever is today's date versus some column date in in a table say how much days have been passed since the order was shipped typically how you would do is get today's date look at a column value whatever is the date value for shipped and you take a difference so sql server allows us to do all these things using some inbuilt functions right if you want to get today's date there is a function if you want to add two dates there is a function if you want to uh, find the difference of just days between two dates there is a function similarly if you want to find a difference between uh, two dates and just give me the months how much months have passed between the two um, uh, dates there's a function so there are a lot of functions and actually you can even use a combination of these lot of functions to create something very complex so let's start with something very basic and then what we'll do is we'll start writing some queries against some table so the way you can do that is say select get date right and if you run a query you basically get today's date that is july 11th 2015 right so this is the very simplest form of date manipulation get date will just give you the current date okay now if you want to 
get if you want to say subtract two days from this right you can say get date and just say minus two and it'll kind of show you it's july 9th 2015 okay so just basic subtraction many times you don't really want this entire date right you just want to know the date parts the month part or the year part and that's very critical right you might find what else so if you get a query like okay give me the average not even average give the the number of years that a person has been with the company so what do you do you look at the higher date you look at today's date and you subtract both of them and then basically get the number of years one of the ways of doing that is okay give me the number of days and one year is 365 days and you do the math but sql server provides us some inbuilt functions to do these things so let's have a look it's typically called as the date part so it goes something like this select date part and then basically you say i want the year for today so whatever is today's date i just want the the year section of it so this will give me 2015 and again you can always give aliases you know um, like we discussed before so this column will be called as year number and similarly you can do something like this for months it's called mm and you can refer to the msdn documentation to get all these syntaxes but when you start a bracket it generally gives you a hint as to what will be returned and what is the expected parameters so this will give you seven since today is july and by now you must have got an idea of how this works so for day what you do is you use the term dd and today is the 11th day okay so this is the date part now we looked at one of the ways in which we just added two days to this right but it gave you the the entire string and then you can manipulate the dates but there are some inbuilt functions which will allow you to do this and that's precisely called as date add so what date add does is you know it allows you to add four days or five months or three years depending upon you know how you want to deal with it to any date so we can we can say something like select date add date add is a function and as soon as you open the bracket it kind of gives you a hint as to what interval you want what's the increment and the expression so you, so let me say that i want to add four days so that's why i use the day um, parameter to current day so today is july 11th and i add four days you will get july 15th right and and again you can use the same concept to put any custom date this can be a column something like that so um, say july 4 2015 should give you july 8 2015 right okay and you can extend the same concept to um you know month so you say add four months to whatever today is so you get november um and then you can also use the same concept to add four years to the current date so you get 2019 so you get the idea it's basically just playing around with the parameters and then you know working this thing out now dates are really really powerful once you know at least some of the basic functions because most of our analysis and stuff is going to require dates and it's really critical when we combine aggregation with dates and you know give me the average um, turnover rate or something for a quarter right so here so many things are involved when you say a quarter then definitely dates are involved right and then you'd find averages and stuff like that so you might have situations where you can say okay for the last three months give me um say say the number of hours worked but don't count saturdays and sundays right so you can always use intelligent queries to find the day part and if the day part is six or seven saturday or sunday then you avoid them and so on and so forth but th these things just give you a basic idea all right let's look at a table so let's look at uh, let's try to find some table which might have a date and then you know at least try to run one query against it so um let's see work order should have a date probably yeah it has a date time date time wow it has three dates cool 
So let me run, let me just show you some sample data from this table so that we can play around with it. Let's call what, work order, something work order, okay. Okay, um, let's say select top 10 star from this. Okay, I need to make sure I'm connecting to the right database. Okay, so it has a work order ID, a product ID. It has a start date, end date, due date, right? Um, let's try to play around with this. Okay, let's say I want the work, or work order ID. So that's pretty simple. We, we don't need to do any manipulation here. I need the product ID again very simple I need the <clears throat> start date and end date and what I need is the difference between those two things so I'm going to use the date diff function and I'm going to say difference of days between the start date and the end date okay and from this table so I just want to show you how to you know utilize this when you're querying against a table and then gives you that it, it's it's 10 days so it's 7 4 and 7 14 so so 10 days right so you know think about it this way the table that i showed you basically had stuff like due date start date and end date and you could actually say if due date minus the difference between these two is greater than zero, then it's under schedule or it's all, you know, things like that. You can you, you can play with this infinitely once you know the different functions and how to use them. Okay, let's try to do something tricky now. Let's, okay, let's say I want to get the first day of this month. Okay, so the way you can do is, let's see, so this month is um, the 11th of July. So one of the ways that we can get the first day is, let's do one thing. Let's see, uh, let's get the date part of this one. So date part, day, and get date, right? So this is 11. So what I need to do, is I need to get today's date and I need to subtract it with the previous day right that will give me answer as one so what I'm going to do over here is this is the previous day so this should give me my previous day hopefully yes and what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the date add function and I need to subtract so I'm using this and say from today. So this will give me the first day of this month. So again, you see that there are so many functions involved here, date part, get date, so on and so forth. Now, again, once you know these different functions, you can really play around with different combinations and get a feel of it. So these are the various things that you can do with dates. Of course, there are lots of other functions also provided, but you know, to, to get started with, these are the basic things you would require in order to run some queries. In this session, we are going to have a look at some functions that SQL Server provides. So there are many types of functions that SQL Server provides that is inbuilt. Uh, one of them being aggregate functions, right? So you have a set of rows and you want to find the averages so you have to find the sum you find the count and so on and so forth the second set of aggregate functions that you would commonly use is string functions right you 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 have a lot of data that is just text data and you want to manipulate that text data right something like um, um, convert everything to uppercase or convert everything to lowercase or concatenate two strings um, you know something like that so those things would be really very really useful when you want to do uh, that operation. So let's look at some examples. And what we're going to do here is we are going to reuse a table that we created. You remember we created the my salary table and we're going to run some aggregate functions um, in that one. Okay, so let's first look at 
the my salary table so I'm going to say select star from my salary and sure enough we just have three rows we kept it very simple and what we're going to do is we are going to find the average of the salaries that is average of 10,000 8,000 and 6,000 that is this column and the way you can do that is using an inbuilt function called select AVG or average and you give the column name right and it'll automatically you know add them and divide by three and it'll give you the result 8000 now similarly if you just want to get a count right there is an inbuilt function called count of salary and from my salary so it's basically three entries okay now tell me what will happen if I write something like this select count of star from my salary basically saying count of everything what will happen you will still get three because it's a row wise operator and it's just counting the number of rows okay all right let's proceed and let's open up our table again and write some other function so what we'll do is we'll find the summation of all the rows that is 10,000 plus 8,000 plus 6,000 and the way we do it is using the function called sum of salary from my salary right so let us execute both of this so 10,000 plus 8,000 plus 6,000 is 24,000 okay let's look at something else let's find the minimum salary so your minimum salary is 6,000 from the whole table and so the way you do it is using the word min the keyword min salary from my salary minimum is 6000 and similarly you can extend that same idea to find the maximum salary as well so these are some of the functions that are inbuilt to you know uh, perform some aggregation so of course when you query you will use where clauses and stuff give me average month wise or give me average year wise um, you know that's where your group by clauses and all those come into picture give me um, just the average of distinct rows something like that but you know you you, you get to you get to combine these different set of functions to kind of manipulate your data all right so once we have this let's move forward let's look at some string functions and for string functions what we're going to do is we're going to use the my order table that we created just in the last session so select star from my order and just four rows to keep it simple some order one two three four this is when we played around with joints um, we created this so let's look at a concept of concatenating two strings right and the way we do it is you can just first of all write something like this concat my string one and my string two oops string one comma string two so this is how we get it if you want to put a space just to make it look nice so the concatenate function or concat function basically takes takes a set of parameters and just joins them together or concatenates them together so if we were to concatenate strings from this table let's try out something like this select uh, order number um, order name and let's say concat my order name give it a space with itself right just order name space order name and let's also give this an alias as concatenated text from my order let's see if this works sure enough you see that it basically concatenated the same values um, and that's the result okay now since I have you here let me show you something else let's uh, concatenate with a random number so that we look at one more function it is called rand random function and it'll just return you know a random number 
Uh, I believe it's between 0 and 1, but I'm not sure. Yep. Okay. All right. So now, since we, we are playing around with string functions, sometimes you would like to not concatenate a string, but to take just a portion of your string. Right. One example I can give you is uh, in, in one of the databases I've been dealing with, it stores email messages, right? It has a column to store a subject line. It has a column to store some body and stuff like that. And typically this data basically says that, um, you know, for in the subject line of the email, the first five characters would be some product ID followed by a colon and followed by some custom subject line. So I wanted to extract the first five characters from the subject line that is a string. The way we do it is, there are many ways to do it and let me show you some of them. One is using the left function. The left function goes something like this, select and let's say order number, order name. And what I want is the first five characters in the left side, right? So I want from my order name only the first five characters. Let's see what the results look like. So sure enough, it gave me just the five characters. Now, similarly, you can do the same for your right also. And the function name is, you know, just call right. Let me put a comment here so that it's easier. And it gives you from the rightmost part, um, you know, five characters. We looked at left, we looked at right. Now, what if you want just something in the middle, right? How would you do that? And the way we do that is using something called as a substring. Substring is again uh, an inbuilt function. And what you can do is select order number, order name, and we use substring. And the way this works is you give the column name and say that, okay, I need from character number two to character, and you know, go, go five places to the right from character number two. Let's look at the results that'll give you a good idea. So, oops, from, my order and you see that what it did was it started from character number two and went up to five places to the right right so if i say something like three it'll start from character number three and go to five places and so on and so forth so this is where you need to you know do something in the middle right you need to do some string manipulations right in the middle okay now you see the order name column, everything is in uppercase. What if I want to just make everything as lowercase? The way we do it is using the two low, uh, the lower function. So select order number, order name, just to look at it. And I say that, oops, and I say that, use the lower function and give me just the order name in lowercase. So it just converted everything to lowercase. And naturally, you can use the same thing to convert everything to uppercase also. And the keyword is pretty much, you know, you must have guessed it, it's called upper. And this will give you the uppercase characters. Okay, great. So we looked at uppercase, we looked at lowercase. How about we look at the length? I mean, many times you might want to know what is the length of the string. And, and we will look at some examples where you would use it. Um, but the way you can get the length is using the len or length function, which is again in will just count the characters, count the number of characters in your um, column, in your input, and return an integer. So everything is 10 characters and it returns an integer. All right. Now let's look at, hmm, let's, let's try to do something something interesting. Let's combine a couple of functions. What I want to do is in this order name, I want to display the first letter in uppercase and remaining everything in lowercase, right? So how do you do that? 
Well, there are many approaches to do that. And one of the way is, you know, let's say order number, order name. And the way I'm going to do it is uh, using the concat function, right? I'm going to convert the first letter to an upper and the convert everything else to lower and I'm going to concatenate both. So how can we do that? So first thing is I need to convert the first one to upper. So I'm just going to use the left function and get the order name and just take one character. So this will give me the, you know, the first um, letter in uppercase. Then what I want to do is I want to say convert. So I'm saying, um, let's say, okay. Next, I want to select from character number two to end of string, right? So again, it's it's basically the substring function. And what I need to do is order name from character number two to end of string. Now, how do I know end of string? It's very simple. We use the length function to get the length of string, right? And we just concatenate both of them, simple. Hopefully this should work. Let's see. Oops, this didn't work. Oh, wait. Um, substring. Ah, I need to convert this to lower. Okay, this. Perfect. So you see that this basically took the first character, converted into upper. Then it took from second character to end of the string that converted to lower and we just concatenated both these strings. So this is one example where you would, you know, use your string manipulations and stuff like that. Uh, the other one I wanted to show you was the trim functions. Now, many times your data may contain spaces, right? Something like this. My text, some custom text, space, 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 space. So naturally this you know, it accounts for spaces as well. And the way you can actually um, see that is, you know, if you run a length function over this, it'll actually count the spaces as well. So you see the length is 10, right? And the way you can remove these spaces is there are there are multiple functions, the two functions actually. One is remove spaces on the left side and remove then remove spaces on the right side. So it's called the left side L trim or the left trim. And you just insert it's, it's it's a function so if you just write l trim and you know your your text it'll basically remove the spaces from the left side of the text but it'll still retain the ones on the right side and by now you must have guessed to remove them from right hand side you basically use the r trim now if you want to remove spaces from both you rightly guessed it you use both left trim and then right trim. Okay, so these are some of the examples where you would use these functions. And I think we have covered quite uh, some of the critical stuff that you would require, some date manipulation, some string manipulation, um, uh, aggregate functions and stuff, which you would typically require in your day-to-day -day work or analysis that you would ever need to do. All right, so we are at the end of the course now and let's take a quick rewind of what we have done so far and also quickly discuss about what are the next steps, uh, what are the other things you could do uh, in the BI stack and what are the other trainings that I provide. Um, first of all, we looked at uh, database concepts, table concepts, what is a database, how do tables fit in, how data flows into it uh, we also looked at basic querying, right? How to create tables, how to create databases. We looked at select queries. We looked at create, uh, update, and delete, how to join different tables, how to run some aggregations, how to run, um, how to manipulate dates, what are the date functions, and so on and so forth. So by now, you should have a comfortable, you should be comfortable writing basic queries and, you know, um, playing around with data. So if you are 
you know, maybe going for an interview which requires some simple T-SQL queries, this should pretty much, you should be able to get started with this one. Now, if you want to take the next step um, in learning more in the BI stack, the next steps would be definitely knowing more about stored procedures. Um, it should be custom functions, not customer functions, um, triggers, views, temporary tables, and so on and so forth. Um, and I will be releasing an intermediate course as well um, soon. That should give you a good idea of various things that you could do apart from just simple queries. And advanced concepts would be another series which would cover things like database tuning, query tuning, and so on and so forth. Like, you know, what is differences between clustered indexes, um, non-clustered indexes, um, you know, how do you tune them, how do you decide where to use a index and stuff like that. Uh, we'll also look at some CLR, c -sharp CLR profilers, and how to load very large data sets, um, and so on and so forth. So we'll look at a few examples in those where we actually load huge amount of data sets. The next, uh, of course, is a different concept where um, you know we, we talk about ETLs. ETLs is nothing but extract, transform, and load. Is basically how to extract data from different systems. Say CSV, Excel files, from an Oracle to a SQL, SQL to Oracle, or something like that. And that's where um, you know a lot of ETL concepts and stuff come into play here. Things like you know when you are transferring huge data sets, what should be a buffer size? What is your speed? What is the speed of your machine? And stuff like that. So there are different things to consider over here to optimize your extract, transform, and load. And again, we'll split it up into beginners, intermediate, and advanced courses. There are a couple of things we can do in reporting, um, majorly being SQL Server Reporting Services, or SSRS. And you know that's a Microsoft product, and what are the different reporting tools is provided, reporting facilities it provides. Tableau is another tool where I'll release a separate course um, where we can look at uh, what are the different aspects, what how, how can you create really, really good visualization by connecting to different data sources, how to quickly create reports, how to quickly create very professional quality reports, and so on and so forth. We'll, sometime later, I will start with some big data analytics as well. We'll start with Hadoop for beginners, how to you know get into just basic querying, what is Hadoop and stuff like that. We go into something intermediate and then we'll go into some advanced concepts as well. So hope you like my course. Thank you very much for watching uh, my course and please provide me your suggestions and feedback as well. Thank you.